There we go. Hopefully this records. <laughs> 21st. 21st. Okay. The third one over. There you go. Can't backdate your attendance here. I want to, uh, I want to remind you, okay, we had that split, and we are now at a, the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah, and I put it on the top of the sheet. I think it's important because if you remember, I told you, he says, if you go back and look, I don't remember which verse it is. It's the verse where it says it was the Feast of Dedication. And it says, specifically, it was winter storms. Now, I told you, the Greek isn't going to tell you, isn't going to remind you again that there's winter storms. But you're going to see the effect of the winter storms. It, um, Greek is concrete. Do you remember back, and if you, if you remember back to chapter 3 with Nicodemus, and that whole thing is mistranslated. You know, it says, you don't know where the wind comes from, but it's not the wind, it's Penuma. You know where Penuma comes from. Spirit, the conscious, the, the conscious breath, free will, but it equates it, as I said, in our, you know, Bible, in our translations, it equates it with wind, which is incorrect. It's supposed to be spirit. But then, if you notice, we have this, this point in the Hanukkah, and it doesn't say this anywhere else. It doesn't make the point about the weather. But it specifically says it's a feast of dedication, and then it says that it's winter and stormy. Now, I want you to remember this. We'll forget it, probably, because when we get to 18 and Jesus is arrested, guess what it says? It's stormy. We also have this, this parallel about no one can snatch them out of my father's hand, which, by the way, will have a parallel in 18. This writer is a very sophisticated writer. We, on the other hand, are very unsophisticated translators and readers. The Greek is very specific and very exacting in what it gives us. Unfortunately, we usually don't sit down and read in Greek, of course, the whole of John in one shot. Although many times people will read the whole of John. It's a pretty short book, right? But the thing about reading John, especially in the Greek in one shot, is all of these, these nuances can come out. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, but, you know, we, we, we go to do so many a, a, a day because we're trying to understand the depth of this. But do you see what I'm saying to you? You know, we're looking at not quite microscopically or, or uh, you know, x-raying. We're trying to x-ray and find out what everything says. There's also another level that the Greeks that are hearing this, re read to them and hearing it, they're seeing this. They see a macro level, right? They see all of it because they understand the words perfectly. We don't. We got to we got to dig the words out. They see them all, and then they see it in a, con con a, a continuum, right? The continuum is that logos to tell us, a logical argument. Unfortunately, our brains, we're not trained that way, which is really kind of sad in some ways. It, it would be in the perfect world, right? We would have learned Greek when we were four years old in uh, first grade. We would learn a Greek, right, a little Greek, and maybe some Latin. And as we uh, went up through the grades, we would have gotten better and better at it. And then we would have understood English and some Greek and maybe some Latin. And we all say, oh, yeah, we want some Hebrew too, right? Just we're throwing it on. And some French and some German and Italian. Wait, in Europe they do that. Oh, man. Some countries they even speak three languages as their main languages. And they speak it perfectly. Oh, well. Yeah, we're Americans. We're, we're Americans, <laughs> right? Of course, you know, we do have an excuse. English is the most complex and difficult language in the modern world. I must say that. And that's the reason people have so, much pro so many problems when they're not 
born into English, which is interesting, right? Both with accents and with uh, the details, because English is a very complex language. Uh, one of the greatest authors, in my opinion, Ayn Rand, learned English as a second language and wrote classics in it that are still like on the bestsellers list. Now, that's a genius, but whatever. Anyway, so we're at 29, and here was the last thing. My father has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. And that was... Um, there was a previous statement. I guess I'll go that, go there. I give them, and I give life perpetual to them, and they shall not be destroyed away from into the age, and will not seize any one of them by force from out of my hand, out of my hand. Now watch what he says. And he says, here is the translation: My father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. Whose hand was just in the the statement before? Jesus' hand, right? And now he says, out of my father's hand. Now what do you think he's going to say next? This is where we're getting into the Beatles stuff. My father, which gave them me, gave them me, is greater than all. No man is able to take them out of my father's hand. That's Greek. The father of me, he has given to me the whole great he is. There's our identity. And not even one he is powerful or able to seize from out of among of the hand of the Father. My Father has given to me the great whole he is. Wait, wait. This isn't what the translation says. This is what the Greek says, though. My Father has given to me of the great whole he is. That is certainly not what our... NIV, my father which gave them me is greater than all. Wait, 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 wait. But the Greek doesn't say that. The Greek says, my father is given to me of the great whole he is. And not even one is powerful to seize from out of the hand of the father. Before he says, out of his hand, Jesus' hand, and now he says, out of the father, and here's the kicker. All right. Because Jesus just equated himself with God. That's a direct, a direct, I am God, basically. He just said, I'm God. He can't take him out of my hand. And he just said, my father has given to me of the great whole he is. In other words, the father gave me himself, right? As... That's about as close as you get to saying, I am the Father. And then the next one, I and the Father are one. And of course, in the Greek, this is a very simple Greek. I and the Father are one. You can't miss this. Ego. Ego and the a Father one are. It's identity form. And I, the Father, are one. I and my Father are one. Okay, in English, that's. That's pretty clear. The Greek states it this way. And I, the Father, are one. When you look at it in the Greek, you know, this I and the Father are one. Okay, I and my Father are one. You know, in English, we'd say euphemistically, uh, okay, uh, you know, uh, what? One in thought? One in heart? One in mind? But when you see in the Greek, and I, the Father, are one, what does that tell you? What is he saying? God. Yeah, we're the same. Same. we're the same. We're the same. We're not any different. You know, in English, like I said, you can qualify. You said, you know, because we're euphemistic in our thinking. Like-minded. Yeah, we're like-minded. We're related, right? We're cousins. We're friends. In English, that statement is um, can have all kinds of connotations, can have all kinds of equivalencies. But when you look at it, the Greek, you know, it's identity form. And I, the father of one. This, to me, is the entire punchline. And the punchline that 
it comes directly from is this statement, this is a feast of dedication. And remember, that's not a that's not a Torah or a Tanakh feast. That's the added feast that comes from the Maccabean era in period, which uh, some might say some interesting things about that. Number one, Jesus acknowledged it, or John acknowledged it, or God acknowledged it, you know, if you like to think that way, right? Which I think is okay thinking. But even more important is it said it's the Feast of Dedication, which celebrates the fact that they defeated, the Maccabees defeated the Seleucids, the Greeks. What do you think the audience is thinking here? The audience knows the Feast of Dedication celebrates the fact that they restored the temple, they defeated the Greeks, and that life was all better. No, then they, then they invited the Romans in to help. Okay, not a good idea, but do you see this? This is what they're, what historically it means to the people. And so when Jesus is making this statement, number one, we're talking, to, we're talking about the Feast of Dedication. So therefore, it's the restoration of the temple. What do you think Jesus means by the restoration of the temple? Eventually, we're going to get to the point, right? They've already talked about it at the very beginning. When Jesus was walking along, and what did John the baptizer say? John the immerser say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Bingo! Bingo! <clears throat> That's way back in chapter 1, but you can never forget the fact we've moved on, yet we haven't moved on. because. We have got to have the reconciliation of God with the people. And therefore, the reason, you notice, it, it, I don't think they said it's Shakot. They did say it's Passover in one case, uh, but Passover is reconciliation, right? But it says specifically the, the dedication. I think this is really important. And even if they had to explain it to the audience, but I don't think they have to. Look, you don't have to explain, um, uh, it, it's like explaining the Vietnam War, right? Uh, well, maybe today you'd have to explain it to kids or whatever, to people uh, about the Vietnam War or about the Korean War, about World War II. But that's less than 100 years away, right? The Maccabean War was about one, what, 168. So we're talking you know, uh, recent history in the terms of the big picture of history. You know, when the Greeks are still talking about 500 B.C. and Thermopylae's, right, and, and all that, that's, that was the beginning of their history. And the Greeks are loving the Hebrews because what did the Hebrews do? The Hebrews, history. yeah, they had written down, they had written down the Torah and the Tanakh. And, and they thought that was great. And that was before the stuff they wrote down. Right? The inventors of history are like really pleased by those who first wrote down history. Cool stuff. Anyway, so uh, this is really important because it fits into that. And look what it says. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. Of course, in the Greek, it's about that. It's close. The, Greek, the Jews took up stones against stone. Him. They took up with their hands, certainly accordingly, Palen and New, lift those stones, these Judeans, in order that they might throw stones at him. And translation, accordingly and new, the Judeans took up stones with their hands in order they might throw stones at him. They were going to stone him. Okay? This is a direct proof. This is a proof. Okay? If someone calls himself God, What's the reaction of the crowd? Right? If, if they thought he was kidding, what would they do? They laugh. Yeah. Laugh. Well, <laughs> yeah, great joke. Steinfeld, right? Yeah. On the other hand, if they believed him, they wouldn't have taken up stones. <laughs> uh, 
if oh, that's an interesting statement, if they if if they were truly convinced, it's not a good idea to stone your God, <laughs> right? Yeah. So they obviously thought he was blasphemy. Yeah, Jeff. But it was clear what he said to them that I thought. I mean, there was no misunderstanding. Hmm. You don't pick up stones if you don't actually get what he was telling them. Yeah, and the, well, the point I want for you, I, I mean, you guys, you guys get it, but the thing I want to give you is I want to give you um, evidence, witness, uh, the ability, because, you know, there's people who like Dan Brown, and there are people who, yeah, I, I agree. You know, there's wackadoodles out there. There's professors and professorettes, and they, they make statements like, Jesus never said he was God. Or the church invented the idea that Jesus was God. Or, you know, it wasn't until the Nicene Creed when they said that Jesus was God. But yet you have this. And by the way, when we looked at Mark and Matthew, we haven't really looked at Luke. But, you know, in all those, what do we get? We get Jesus basically directly in Greek saying, hey, I'm God. And the people will go, well, we're going to stone you. Which says, hey, they got it. You know, it, it's like, um, I don't know, don't go into an Islamic country and, and claim to be Muhammad because, you know, you're going to probably get the same treatment, you know, if they believe you, right? Or, or if they understand your words or what you said. So I'm just saying this is really interesting to me. It's interesting to me that I hear it all the time. You know, I read... People send me information, you guys send me information, I read this stuff, you know, and, and they're always making these claims about Jesus. You know, National Geographic, our government even makes claims about Jesus and about, you know, the stuff. And you, and you go, huh? Huh? Where are you getting this? I mean, did you even read the documents? Did you just make this up on your own? And they did. A lot of times these people are making stuff up. Oh, there can't be merit, right? This I hear this all the time when I teach classes to uh, to more secular groups. They go, well, obviously the Gospels are wrong because they mention miracles. And I look at them right in the eye and I go, well, have you ever read Epictetus? Have you ever read uh, maybe, like, have you ever read um, uh, Marcus Aurelius? Have you ever read Caesar? Do you know that every other page is a miracle? Read them. Every other page, ancient literature, is full of miracles. You know, they're, they're sacrificing. Uh, matter of fact, if you go look, go back and reread all those Greek books you were supposed to read when you were kids, right? All those Greek books about Demopolis, what do they do? They sacrificed, and they looked at the guts, and if there was a miracle... Because the guts were right, then they went up and fought, right? And they said it was a miracle we won because the guts showed that we were going to win. Or afterwards, they said the guts were wrong and they showed that we were not going to win and we lost, right? There are miracles on miracles on miracles on miracles that are mentioned in ancient texts. Because many times things happen that they recorded or they wouldn't have recorded them, right? They recorded them because they were miraculous. We see miracles in the New Testament, so it's irrational. It is absolutely the most irrational thing in the world for someone who supposedly studied books in antiquity and going, well, these books talk about miracles, therefore we must throw them in the garbage. I'm like, okay, then you're throwing away plenty, you're throwing away, you know, well, you can throw away the Odyssey and the Iliad because they're not history anyway, but they're full of it, you know. You, you got to throw away everything. In fact, you got to throw away everything up through antiquity. Oh, my goodness gracious. And if you, if anyone, has anyone ever read Christian classics? What are Christian classics full of? The St. Francis of Assisi, St. Teresa of Avila, uh, Lawrence, St. Lawrence, all the saints. What are they full of? Yeah. Miracles. Yeah. All kinds of miraculous things happened to them. They were either aware of them or, you know, I think they all happened. They were just recording them. We're just living in an age where we don't seem to notice miracles very much because, you know, you turn on the microwave 
and, and it heats your uh, your soup, and you're like, that's kind of a miracle, but whatever. You know, and I'm a scientist, so anyway. But Jesus said, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We know. Okay, remember, John is the Simeon. It's the signs gospel. And so, of course, this has got to come up. Because what does Jesus do in John? He gives a sign, a Simeon. And then we get this verbal logos to tell us, beautiful logos to tell us about what it means. Of course, we ignore all what it means, but we get the signs, and it's really cool stuff. <clears throat> Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stow me? This is this is a beautiful, ironic statement in Greek. It's like the perfect, it's like the joke text. Da -da -bum, right? After granted, he glued himself to them, to Jesus. Pola, much many often toils, I have shown, exposed to your eyes. You, beautiful, color of good, well or good, no matter among of the Father, through of what sort of which one of them do you throw stones at me? Jesus concluded for himself to them, I have shown, exposed to your eyes. I love this, right? Remember, this is about the shepherd. Right? The sheep and the shepherd. And the sheep, uh, if you remember, the big deal was the sheep don't have to see. They hear. But Jesus suddenly moves to this. I have shown. I've exposed to your eyes. Obviously, this group is not part of his sheep because they don't hear the tone of the shepherd, which I think is really interesting. You many Beautiful, well or good toils from out of the Father. I have shown you many beautiful toils from out of the Father. He just claimed to be the Father, but he said, I showed you these from the Father. Through which one toil of them do you throw stones at me? Beautiful Greek question. This is like pure Greek, right? Ask the question and see what they do. Like I said, a very straightforward argument in the Greek. And they say, we are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay, those professors and professorettes, I want to have a, a, a discussion with them, because this is like, even in our translations, pretty obvious. The Jews answer and say, for good work we stand thee not, for blasphemy, because... Thou being a man, makest thyself God. Um, I didn't have to wait until 300 A.D. to do this. It's like right there. And this is 90s, uh, 90 A.D. We have documents from the second century of John. John is the closest we got. I showed you all the details back, way back. That's way back, sorry. In the first, they conclude for themselves, Dan. The Judeans threw all over a beautiful one of good of a 12. We do not throw stones at you. Other thing, contrarywise, through blasphemous, slow to call something good. That is really good. Slander. It's interesting. Uh, blasphemous means slow to call something good that is really good. Slander. And that are because you, a man, he being, own, he being, identity, you make or do of yourself a God. And it's not the God, a God, which is interesting, too, right? Because they're not acknowledging that he's calling himself the God, Jehovah, but rather that he is calling himself God. The Judeans conclude for themselves him through all over a beautiful, well, good toil. We do not throw stones at you. Contrarywise, through slow to call something good that is really good. And because you being a man, you make of yourself a God. That is a really straightforward and direct statement in ancient Greek and also in the ancient world. Um, there is, of course, no way they would say that you are the God, right? That would be really opposed to their whole way of thinking about the world and existence. But that you make yourself a God. Very, um, I don't know, I... I 
I, I just think it's funny. It, it's, it's almost irrational. We have these people that are supposed to be so smart in the world, and yet, you know, they, they write things that you go, did you even read it? Did you even understand it? And, and the funny thing is they keep repeating it. I guess if they think if they repeat it enough times, it'll make it true, right? It, it's just like the whole thing I told you. They stopped teaching legal historical method back in the 1900s because legal historical method proves the New Testament and proves the, the docu ancient documents we have. And, of course, you can't have children believing that or thinking that. That would be horrific, wouldn't it? If children actually knew there was truth and could prove truth? Horrific, horrific. But we, do have, we still talked about the scientific method. At some point, when the scientific method is shown to prove God beyond a shadow of a doubt, which it, I think it has already, uh, they will stop teaching the scientific method. Because you can't have methods to know truth that prove things that they don't want. To. Yeah, the, I was trying to think what we call them. Are they the elites? Are they the anti-gods? Uh, it's Satan. Uh, well, okay. They're sorry. already throwing it over. They're saying that the people, like Dr. Fauci, I am the science or whatever. They're saying the experts are the science. Forget all the data. Throw it out. Don't say anything. Just trust me, right? Yep. Just believe what I say. I got AFib because Data of that. Data is misinformation. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I have said you are gods. Now this, this is a very important logos to tell us that we get directly from Jesus here. His answer is not written in your law. I said ye are God. He can put it for himself to them, Jesus. Well, nor not is it graven, written into to the law, to a law, Torah. Of you, that are because I, I said, God's you are. Testing. Jesus concluded for himself to them, Is it not graven in your law that I said, You are God's? I think it's really interesting. Yes, this is a quote. But who's saying it? Jesus is saying it, and Jesus just said that he was God, and they acknowledge that he said he was God, and Jesus just said all the tolls are God, are through God, right? So Jesus is saying, it's like he is saying it directly from historical antiquity. In other words, it's like he's saying, the Torah, is it not written in your law that I said you are God's? I think that's really cool. I mean, I think that is a direct, intentional thing, right? Of course, we translate it, um, is it not written in your law, I said you're God's, like, you know, it, it's like the quote, right? But in the, in the, they don't have quotes, right? There's no quotes, there's no punctuation. It's, so if you read it directly, it's not just a quote, it's, Jesus, God, saying, I said, you are God's. <laughs> like, you know, they should be pulling up this more stones with that one. But anyway, and, and don't worry, they will. <clears throat> don't worry, they will. There's a Tanakh illusion. It's Psalm 82, 6. I think it's kind of funny that he says, in your laws. <laughs> <laughs> in your laws. Not in God's laws. But... Wink, wink, nod, nod, right, right. Yeah. It, there's, there is not, okay, in my opinion, there is not a single word out of place in the Greek. Uh, I, like I told you before, it is much safer and better for us to presume that these documents are historical documents because it gives us a lot stronger footing in the world when we discuss them. Because if you go to somebody and say uh, they're... Um, they're inspired, right? They don't look you right in the hand and go, well, the Bhagavad Gita is inspired, the Quran's inspired, you know, the Zarathustra's inspired, you know, they'll go on, on down the thing. Which one is not inspired? However, if you say it's historical, where does that put you? 
puts her on the same footing as Caesar and Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. So you can say, Jesus said this, right? Without a shadow of a doubt. I don't have to worry about being inspired. Now, as Christians, we can, you know, it, it can be as inspired as we want it to be, and we can gain all kinds of extra knowledge from it that we want. But I'm just saying from a historical standpoint, it is very healthy for us. If you want to fight battles, you're not going to win on inspiration, but you're going to win on historical data. And that's the whole point, right? If you understand it, you got the Greek, you got, you know, you, you've got the history, that puts us in a really strong position. Now, I didn't retranslate this from the Greek, uh, from the Septuagint, but the quotes from the tri tri uh, Septuagint, God presides in great assembly, renders judgment under the gods. Hmm. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked, defend the weak and the fatherless, of all the cause of the poor and the oppressed, rescue the weak and the needy? Deliver from the hand of the wicked. The gods know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. But you will die like mere mortals. You will fail, fall like every other ruler. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. Hmm, there's a lot packed away in that little psalm, in there? A lot of information. But like I said, the minute Jesus says this, right, it's rabbinical context, bang. It should be in the full context. Let's see how that fits. Let's see how this fits. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, which is an interesting translation. You know there's more to this. If he called them gods into whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. All right. If that one there, he said gods, or to whom the logical argument of the failed God, is into his cause to be, and know or not, he is powerful to loosen the graph of writing. If that one there, he said gods, or to whom the logical argument of the God, Cause to be, and he is not powerful to loosen the writing. Um, yes, the Greek is a little complex. And yes, we simplified it, but I think you can kind of gather from this. If that one there, he said gods, okay, that one there is God in Jesus, in other words, Jehovah, to whom the logical argument of the God caused to be. The logical argument of the God, Jesus keeps telling us, that is the gospel. That, you know, we call it the gospel, right? The logical argument of God, Jesus says over and over again, if you trust my logical argument and are persuaded, right, convinced, that's what he keeps telling them. That's what the logical argument of God is, caused to be. And he is not powerful to loosen the writing. What he's talking about is not God loosening the writing. Who would loosen the writing? Who would attempt to loosen the writing? The audience. Yeah, the audience. The, the Judeans, you know, uh, I think the chosen is really cool because you got the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and you see that all that, you know, they, they don't show enough of that that whatever going around. But remember, this uh, it was interesting because at the woman of the well thing, they had the five books of the Bible, right? The Torah, but no more in, uh, in Samaria. But guess what? That's what the priests have. The priests don't trust the Tanakh. They don't trust the Mishnah and the Talmud. It's it's the Sanhedrin, it's not the Sanhedrin, it's the um, Pharisees. The Sadducees, the priests, only have the first five. Guess what they don't have? They don't have Psalms. Psalms is Tanakh. That's Pharisaic. Of course, Jesus is the rabbi of Capernaum. Ooh. Yes, ma'am. Is the word for law then in verse 34 actually Torah as you have in 
quote or parentheses because this is from Psalm, it's not the Torah. It's no, it's no more. It's no more. So yes, it shouldn't probably be Torah. It should be uh, the reason I put nomos is because let's see where is that the previous one is it the previous verse? Uh, 30, 30, 34, yeah. Yeah, the reason I I put in Torah is because generally when we say nomo, nomo is a law, and nomo is the Torah. So is he saying that the Tanakh is just as much scripture as the Torah? I think he is, and I think that's really okay. Look. Jesus, I will never say that Jesus was not an irritant on purpose, okay? I think Jesus, I think Jesus is a wonderful Greek kind of irritant, right? Irony, satire, he is poking the bear all the time, if you haven't noticed, right? And that is part of the thing. I think that he's got, you know, uh, he's in the temple, right? This is in the temple. We already said it was in the um we don't know if he's going into sacrifice or coming out after the sacrifice, but he was in the portico of Solomon. So he's at the entrance to the temple. And so who's there? Regular people, Pharisees, Sadducees, everybody's coming there, right? So guess what? When he says this, what do the Sadducees do? Oh, right? <laughs> what do, what do the, uh, the Pharisees are kind of like, hmm. Well, it's not really the law, the nomos, but see, they use the term nomo, law. The term is used in the New Testament specifically to imply the written, the written Tanakh and Torah all together, right? We Tammy tells me this all the time, and I used to have notes. I put some notes, but I ran out of space for the notes. But this whole thing about the Torah, the Tanakh, the Mishnah, and the Talmud, these are really, really, really important kind of ideas that every Jewish kid knows, right? Well, maybe. Um, hopefully, if they go to Torah school, they'll know this stuff, right? Because that's, that's huge. I was not aware of it until I started studying about Jewish culture, probably uh, you know about 30 years ago. I started really digging into Jewish culture because I thought that would be the beginning of the way to look at this. I found that Greek is a better way of looking at it because you know the even though the the Hebrew ideas and culture are very important, so there's a foundation or basis of that. But the we, what do we got? We got the Old Testament, we got the New Testament, and maybe sometimes we have the Apocrypha, maybe. I'm like, holy smoke. So, you know, we dumped the Apocrypha 200 years ago, but it was in every Bible until 1826, and yet we just threw it out. Well, don't you think we should know a little about the Mishnah and the Talmud, too? And, you know, we acknowledge the Tanakh and the Torah, right? As a matter of fact, we, we claim that it's inspired. The Jewish people claim it's inspired. But half the time, we don't even know where it came from. I, I'm just saying, I think it's really interesting, right? Because these are really important documents. They were so important that people memorized them, right? In the Septuagint. I mean, it'd be really cool to memorize the Septuagint. Oh. <laughs> That's a lot, right? Anyway, uh, but yeah, I, I, your point is well taken. This word law implies the Tanakh and the Torah. And if you notice Jesus quotes from Psalm 20, 82, which means he's talking about Tanakh. And he does equate Tanakh with, with law, which, um, by the way, we agree with, right? That, uh, I, I'll mention this, um, you one of the first things they did in the, uh, when, in the Talmudic documents after Christ is they basically said, they made a comment that no prophecy can come from the Tanakh. Did you know that? 
I, I should get the quote at some point. If it's contact, if it's in context, I'll get the quote for you. I think I have quoted it to you before, but in the Talmud, it specifically says that there is no prophecy that comes from the Tanakh. Do you know why? Because Jesus fulfilled them. <laughs> well, it, uh, that is a good uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, the, the over overarching statement that is correct. Most specifically, the, the claims from Christianity for the fulfillment of prophecy were mostly from Isaiah and the Psalms and from the other Tanakh documents. Because the Torah doesn't, if you remember when you studied the Torah, the Torah did not have a huge amount of messianic, it has some, but not huge amounts of messianic stuff. I have intentionally not gone to Isaiah because I'm not a, a, a Hebrew kind of scholar. And I did the Psalms, so we, we kind of dug into the Psalms a few years ago. But the big deal with this is if you look at the predictions, the, the prophecies, there are all kinds of really cool prophecies that guess what they don't, well, they, they don't. It's unfortunate, you know, we have to say they. The Pharisees especially, the rabbis don't like because They're messianic, and they came true. And if you start looking through them, you go, well, pick Bethlehem, pick the murder of the innocents, pick a virgin shall conceive, pick. I'm like, you know, you keep going down, and guess where all those are? They're in Isaiah, they're in uh, something in Ezekiel, I think, or in Nehemiah. 22. <laughs> they're all over, and then you get Jesus quoting this, right? One of the reasons that they didn't um, remember, one of the reasons in the uh, 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 Jamnia, the Council of Jamnia, they dumped all the Greek Septuagint, the, the Greek, Greek documents from the Septuagint, from the Apocrypha, where it's because what? Those rascally Christians were using the New Testament Greek documents, right? And so they said, well, well, we'll solve this problem. We'll say, the Jewish people can't read the Greek. Don't read the Greek. What do you think all those people that memorized the Septuagint thought? Because the Septuagint is written in Greek. 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 And they're like, wait, wait I, I spent a couple of years memorizing this, and now you're telling me I, I can't use it, I can't recite it, it's like worthless, right? Well, yeah, I think there was like a revolution there. Yes, sir. And they removed the Isaiah 53 from their annual reading program that they, they go through. I hadn't heard that. That's interesting. I didn't. I haven't heard that before. But I, I wouldn't doubt it. It's just like, remember I showed you the text from the Talmud where they said that a, um, a shepherd, a shepherd could not give witness. But a hired shepherd could give witness. <laughs> huh? It's written right there. They equate a shepherd with a, a person committing sexual crimes and criminal activities. And even if you're if you're stealing, you actually got more credit than than a shepherd. Man, this, this is kind of weird, right? You go, know, what what are you doing anyway? Anyway, um, so let's continue. Because there's more to this, and actually this is a whole section. What about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why do you accuse me of blasphemy because I, and I said I am God's son? Right, this is playing off of Psalms. Because it says, I said you are God's. And therefore, he said I'm God's son. Uh, say of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemous because I said I am the son of God. Let's see what it says in the Greek. Whom the Father he regarded as special, and apostel he set apart to her into the cosmon, that which was created. You, you make a logical argument, that are because you are slow to call something and blasphemous. Uh, that are because I said, an offspring of the Theo, of a God I am. I don't think Jesus is backtracking. Let's see what the translation says. We'll talk about it. Whom the Father regarded as special, and set apart into thee that which was created, 
you make a logical argument that you are slow to call something good, uh, blasphemy, because I said an offspring of the God, I am. Now, Jesus did not say he was an offspring of the God. He said he was the God, yes. And uh, I don't think he's obs obscurating or playing games here. What he's doing is he is connecting the dots. The dots he's connecting are the multiples of, number one, the one of the big things is the huios of man, right? The huios, the son of man. The son of man is code word, has always been code word for the Messiah. From the apocrypha mostly, but you also find it in the Tanakh. So Jesus is making a connection. But, okay, to be, um, if you are the son of God, that means you have to be, you have to be God because there's only one. Exactly. You have to be God, right? You notice that they don't talk about, and I think this is very intentional, if we were talking in a Greek sense, we would talk about demigods, right? Hagios, demigods. Hagios is never applied to Jesus. Hagios is applied to us as demigods. And I think it comes from this uh, 82 specifically. But Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, and he also, and here he's calling himself the son of God. Uh, who is, I like who is offspring. It's male offspring. I should probably put a M in parentheses because huios is a male verb or a male noun. But offspring of the God. And you notice ego emi. I think that's a direct indicator right there. He's... Yes, it's saying, I said an offspring of the God, I am. But he's using the term ego emi, which is that identity form in Greek, of course, identity in English too. But in Greek, it's very special because it means most, um, I don't know, egregiously, most specifically, most exactly that I am. I, it, it's a, a direct identity. And let's see what how they respond to the, what we get with this. Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. If I do not do the works of my Father, believe me not. This is interesting in Greek itself. If, no or not, I make a do, the toils of a Father, of me, not a lace, you are persuaded of me. If I do not do the toils of my Father, you are not persuaded to me. I think, look at the translation. If I do not the works of my father, believe me not. That looks like a, uh, it's a qualified negation, but in English, it, it's saying, if I don't do the works of my father, don't believe. Right? Look at the Greek. If I do not do the toils of my father, you are not persuaded to me. In other words, what is he saying to them? It ain't breaking if we can do it. <laughs> well, I think he's I think he's saying to them, they know. Okay, the reason they're picking up stones, the reason they're doing what they're doing is because they saw the toils of the Father. Which means, okay, now put on your Greek hat. If you see somebody doing a miraculous, wonderful sign, like let's say feeding 5,000 people in a symposium, what a cool idea, right? Oh, did that happen? Yeah, he fed 5,000 people in a symposium. He cured the people. He cured the man born mind. He did all these things. So if you see that, what does that do for you? It should prove it to you, right? I mean... I know we live in this really jaundiced age where, okay, so you go see David Copperfield and you go, okay, so that's magic, right? 
Do you believe it? No, it's just, it's a trick, right? They're doing tricks. But what Jesus is saying, and I think this is a, a reality from the standpoint, especially of the ancient world. If you, okay, no trickery, right? If this guy, let's say, heals a man born blind, you notice we went through multiple court trials, trials to prove the guy was born blind. His parents said he was born blind. Yeah, he was no kidding, the guy who was born blind. And the end result was, he can see. Jesus healed him. And, and, and yet Jesus said, it's not important for you to see. It's important for you to hear my tone, my voice, which I think is really hopeful to all of us, right? But yet, the point is, they saw it, right? They saw, they saw him do the toils of the Father. Therefore, what is the expectation from a Greek standpoint? Believe yeah, you should be convinced, because if you're not convinced, you're... <laughs> yeah, you're an idiot. What is wrong with you? Right? It's like it's like if you saw a guy who was, you know, if, if, if it was on the news every day and they had like 100 trials and this guy was no kidding, born blind, and all of a sudden he could see, you know, I hope that every one of us would go, wow, it's amazing. It's a miracle, right? Who did this? How did he do it? And if the person said, I'm God. Uh, okay, you know, that may take a little more, that's a little more difficult, but you're doing God stuff. You see my point here? I think that this right here is the specific. Jesus is saying, you're seeing, if I don't do the toils of my father, you are not persuaded. In other words, I am doing the toils of my father, and therefore you should be persuaded. Because if you're if you're not, there's something wrong with you, right? Uh, it, and by the way, um, this is the tello statement of this argument. I told you, John occasionally will pitch us a telos. He gave us a telos. Now, by the way, he didn't tell you what the argument was, but that's okay. The ultimate argument is. You, you see me doing the toils. You see me doing these these miracles. And the question is, why are you not persuaded? Right? I think, I think this is beautiful Greek. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, look what he says. Here, and even the translation is not bad. We'll see what it says in Greek, though. Believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I and the Father comes right back to that statement. The Father and I are one, uh, but if I do, though you believe me not, believe the works, you may know. It, this, this goes back directly to that statement, the telos statement. Yeah, look at it. If, if but, I make your do, and in case that me, not or less, this qualified negation, you are persuaded. To toils, you are persuaded. <laughs> In order that you may come to know, and look, look at the words you use. Note, come to know, gnoske, may know, especially through personal experience, better because in me, a father and I, into the father. But if I do, if I do, and in that case, if you are not persuaded, if I do, I do, and you are not persuaded to me, the toils you are persuaded. In other words, even if you're not persuaded about me, look at the miracles I did, right? You should be persuaded by what I what you saw, right? Otherwise, you're dumb. You, you know, he's being kind to them, but whatever. I mean, he probably should do what uh, uh, in Mark, right? You stupid disciples. Anyway. Uh, you told me for a biological argument, in order that you may come to know, and you may know through personal experience, you may come to know, and you may know through personal experience that into me, the Father, and I into the Father. 
I think this is a direct, obvious, you know, he's, he's base repeating. And look, they get it because look what they do. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Um, the proof text of this whole thing is that in each case, when Jesus makes these comments, it is very obvious that they, they get it. They understood it. They didn't miss the point, right? As a matter of fact, they were really irritated because he said, I am, I am I'm God. God and I are the same, right? And now he went and he made this beautiful logos. The logos is, okay, so you don't believe that the Father and I are the same, right? Look at the toils. Look at the signs I'm doing. The signs should tell you what? That these are only things that God can do. And, and by the way, I, I should, let's see, do I have time? Yeah, I got a couple of minutes. This goes back to a very, very important point. And if you remember C.S. Lewis, can't forget C.S. Lewis, but C.S. Lewis wasn't the inventor of this idea. It comes out of Greek worldview. Okay, so when I create the natural world and the natural order of things, we call that, and if I drew the picture, I get stuff here, maybe I can, if I try to draw a picture, maybe I could draw the picture. Um, Maybe, maybe you can see most of it. Okay, so I got the plenum of everything, right? Plenum of everything. That's just the, everything. And then there's the creation, the cosmos. This is the cosmos. And within the cosmos is the philosophia. And then within the philosophia is the gay. The gay is what you can measure. It's what you can test with the scientific method. It's the world. It's the creation. It's a created world. It's all that stuff you can touch, you think, and you can feel. But the philosophy includes all those things that you know, you can know, that humans can know, that men, people can know, but yet are not measurable. You have emotions. You have thoughts. You have ideas. You have math. All these are not real in the gay. They're not measurable in the gay. They are philosophia ideas. And then there are things that you can't know that are outside of it. Now, everything in the gay has to follow what? Laws of nature, maybe? Yeah, we, we call it laws. I don't like the laws of nature. We could call it natural law or, or the laws of God. Or we could say it, it follows the world. God set up the world, right? And he said, this is going to be the gravitational constant. This is going to be this constant. This is going to be this constant. He set all the constants in place, and the, the entire universe fulfills those, those realities, right? So if I want to affect the world, how is the only way that I can affect the world? How can I change the world? If I want to, make, if I want to feed 5,000 people with, what, three loaves and two fishes, how is the only way I can do that? I can't do it in the gay. You have to transcend, yeah. I have to reach, right, outside of the cosmos. The cosmos follows all the laws of God, right? I have to reach out from outside the cosmos, reach into it, and I have to manipulate it. These are what we call acts of God. Right? We call them miracles. And so therefore, the fact that Jesus did these shows what? That he's outside the cosmos where that's where God is. Yeah. And let me, okay, okay. Uh, what are you going to say? Well, the prophets, like, I mean, other people also did miracles. Of course, it was God's power. But like when Elijah and Elisha did their miracles or whatever, they were still only human. So... You know, couldn't they, the people who didn't want to believe he was God, just argue he's like those other prophets. It's the power of God, but he's just human. They could. However, the claims he made are very interesting. And also, remember the audience here? I think it's Greeks and Romans, mostly. Okay? Yes, there are Hebrews in that audience. 
But the main audience is Greeks and Romans. And what do the Greeks know? That's what the Greeks know. The Greeks know that the only way that you can change the laws now, the Greeks still got the animism base, they still got the pantheonic paganism base, but, the, but they know that even the gods of the Greeks, what can the Greek gods not do? They cannot, they cannot change the laws that affect them. Now, the Greeks would not understand. The, yeah, well, see, the Greeks wouldn't say we understand the law of physics yet. They haven't got to that point. They haven't, you know, the, the scientific method is barely there, right? But yet they would say that we understand the laws of the world and nature and that you, you, just, can't, you just can't change them, right? So the gods themselves must face, must live within that world. However, if you have someone coming into the cosmos from outside, and by the way, this is C.S. Lewis stuff, right? In mere Christianity, I believe. That that's the way miracles happen. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray you look at this this week. In your name we pray. Amen. And the prophets never claimed that they were doing it. They, they never claimed they that were, they were God. Or the and they were doing it through God. Yeah, see what happened to Moses? When the apostles did miracles too, they healed and uh, healed a blind man and so forth. But they said through 